If all the children, second grade and under, go to Children's Church, the rest of you open your Bibles to John chapter 1 as we continue going through the book of John, but we're also, last week and this week, doing a little extra with this as well, because we're looking at the church. Why? Does God have Brown Road Baptist Church here? We heard Daniel give a fantastic testimony last week of his life before and after Jesus. As a matter of fact, Daniel told me this week, said I didn't get it all in. So if you've got a few minutes, a little dead space in there, get me back up. Uh, so he even wants to tell more about it. But another aspect of the church is prayer. And Joy, come on up, Joy. Joy is going to give a testimony this morning of a miraculous healing that God has brought about in her life. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about that we a microphone any of them thank you good morning family i'm going to turn to first before i begin to hebrews hebrews 11 verse 1 now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen and for the past two years, my blood levels have been rising, both red blood cells and white blood cells. And so I've had blood tests, and my internist just happened to work for, at Mayo, this is at Mayo, uh, one of the most world-renowned hematologists and oncologists before she switched to being an internist. So she had an in. And she said, you know, I just, I can't figure this out. She decided to consult him, and he, he's usually got at least a three-month wait. You can't get into him. He says, oh, okay, we'll squeeze her in. Let's see what's going on here. Um, so I went to that, had, had more blood tests, more than you can imagine. So specialized, they had to send it up to Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And the blood was worked on. No answers came back. So frustrating. I don't know if any of you have ever been in that position. You think in today's world we have all the medical answers, but we don't. And so he, it's disheartening to come in back into the room and say, we have, no, we have no answers. We have to run more tests. So we're going to move to a bone marrow biopsy. And so uh, my husband and I did that. And he said, when the results come back, make sure your husband comes with. Now, I don't know if any of you guys, how many have been in that position, but you know that's pretty serious. So we prayed. We brought it to family. We brought it to you guys. And I was at the point where, you know, the first thing you think of is your children. And I just prayed to God whatever his decision is, whatever his will is, to just protect and watch over our children and prepare us for what we had ahead of us. Uh, that's when I, I came to my Bible school class at 930. That's run by um, Carol Denadel. Where are you? Are you here? There she is. And it's such a special group. They laid hands on me and prayed, and we shared tears and cried. And the belief is just so strong. Uh, my mother refused to believe that this was anything but healing. She prayed. That was all she was going to believe. That's all she believed. Anytime I talked to her, that's all she believed. And they did the same for me. So I had my bone marrow biopsy. Uh, went back in, it, waiting over a holiday, Thanksgiving holiday. 
It's just the worst. And then to find out they didn't run the tests. So I think, as a nurse, I've seen what doctors have done behind the scenes. I'm pretty positive he called up to Mayo Clinic in Rochester and said, you guys better run these. <laughs> Uh, so I had to reschedule. I came back two days later. He worked me in. And just sitting there waiting for him to enter the room, my husband and myself, we looked at each other, and there are no words. It's just that look that you share, you know, that you just got to hold on and wait. And he walked in and had the biggest smile on his face. He put my chart down, and he says, all I have is good news. We've run... Uh, see, what did they run? Nuclear, molecular, and DNA studies. They picked over my blood with a, and bone marrow with a fine-tooth comb, the best technology they have in the world. He says, I have no answer for you. There is no medical answer for what we have found, have not found. And that is there, he says, I can't explain it. Maybe in 10 years with technology, uh, and he said, furthermore, the blood that you had run this morning, because they pulled out more, they got more blood. He said, m if you look at my chart, Mayo Clinic has, I don't know if any of you guys go there, but you can check your lab labs online, and they show charts of how you're doing. Mine was steadily going like this for two years. The day I had my blood drawn to go over the bone marrow results, my blood dropped down to normal. He showed me the graph. He says, I have no explanation for this. And I said, I do. <laughs> I said, I, I believe. And he looked right in my eyes and he said, so do I. <laughs> so I have to go back every three months and still, you know, he went through all that. And my husband is such a, has such an analytical mind. I'm sitting there praising the Lord, yet just so I don't care what I don't care what else came out of his mouth. You know, it's that mommy moment after your babies are born, and you're like, I don't care what else there is, and just you know, good news, baby's crying, ten fingers, ten toes. He's over there, you know, asking all these analytical questions, and the hematologist just said, I I don't have the, with with my knowledge and the the technology I have at my fingertips, I have no answer for you. Because he likes concrete. <laughs> he just thinks that way. So I'd like to close with sharing another verse. In Mark 9, chapter 14, where the boy is healed. Mark 9, 23. All things are possible. All things are possible to him who believes. So I don't, I don't know why this happened to me. I think about it a lot, and I try not to because we need to have the faith of a child. But I believe that there's a reason for it. And maybe, maybe one of you out there has it and will share with somebody else what has happened to me. Because that's, all, that's what it's all about. It's about God working through us. Amen. Joy is just one of the people that have been healed. Uh, we got two or three others sitting in here right now that have been healed of cancer this year. You can look around because her hair is just starting to grow back. <laughs> uh, we've got some others that got the ultimate healing where they'll never be sick again, never have another pain or anything else. God took them on home to be with him in heaven. And that is the ultimate healing. And I told you I had a purpose for the people that came. Daniel, so we can see we need to be out working, telling people about Jesus because they need him.
terribly bad they need him. But we also need to be a church that believes in and practices prayer. And I will be talking with the deacons later this month because I believe, now this isn't traditional Southern Baptist, but so what? I believe we need to have a time in our services that if anyone wants to be prayed for, that they come and our deacons pray for them for healing, for whatever that need is. And if they request to be anointed with oil, they get anointed with oil. I think that's biblical. May not be traditional, but I think it's very biblical and Brown Road needs to be a church that does things biblically before we think about well we've never done that before so be praying about that because we need to believe God does things when we pray and when we pray with faith believing that he will do it then God will work in our midst. Now, as we go back to John, we're looking at following Jesus, or are you a follower? Now, I'm going to give three things that a follower does. If they are a follower or a, we could say, disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, This is, I read the first part of this last week, going to read the second part of it this week. Uh, This is the very first people that are beginning to follow Jesus as the Messiah. The verses we looked at last week, two of John's disciples followed Jesus when Jesus walked by and John said that, Behold the Lamb of God. And they left John and started following Jesus. One of the two was Andrew. Andrew, after staying with Jesus a while, went and got his brother Peter and, well, Simon, and said, We have found the Messiah. And verse 42, it says, And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So these are the first three. Now stand with me as I read beginning in verse 43 and going on down to 51. At the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite, indeed in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, which is teacher, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son 
of man. Father, as we come to you again this morning, we give you all honor and glory for everything you're doing. Father, we praise you for what you're going to do through this church, especially if we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and do your work in his power, then your blessings will come, growth will come, spiritual growth, numerical growth, but we've got to work your way and do it for your glory, not ours. And I just thank you right now for what you're going to do, what you are going to bring about, in Jesus' name, amen. You be seated. I want us to think about being a follower or a disciple of Jesus Christ. What is involved in that? And how would you know if you are a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now there are people that can say, I'm a disciple, I'm a follower, but they're nowhere close to being one. They're one in name only. So as we look at these verses, there are three things that I want us to understand about being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, a follower is a believer. A follower is a believer. Now, when we go back and put ourselves there in the crowd with John the Baptist, and here comes Jesus walking by, and John says, Behold the Lamb of God. Andrew and another disciple left John. They were disciples of John the Baptist. They left John, and they started following Jesus. They had to believe. When John said, Behold, the Son of God, and then we find uh, Philip going, Philip, right, going to Nathaniel, yeah, Philip going to Nathaniel, and said, we found the one that Moses and the prophets have been talking about, have been prophesying about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph, a carpenter, from Nazareth. Phil, or Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's kind of like here. Can anything good come out of AJ? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> I've heard that ever since I've been here. <laughs> If you live there, come back next week. <laughs> but he said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Put yourself in that crowd. Here is one person, John the Baptist. Behold the Son, or the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Can you imagine the boldness of that step of faith that those two men took that day? Jesus had done no miracles, had done no teaching. He just was. And John the Baptist knew who he was because remember when Mary, Jesus' mother, went to visit her cousin Elizabeth and they were both pregnant, Elizabeth with John the Baptist, Mary with Jesus, that John leaped in the womb 
of Elizabeth with joy because the mother of the Savior of the world had come into the presence of Elizabeth. John knew from the beginning who Jesus was. But for these two followers and the followers following, imagine how big a step of faith they took to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, to give up their belief that a Messiah is coming and to transfer that belief in a Messiah is coming to Jesus of Nazareth is that Messiah. Now we talk about how hard it is for someone to believe today. After centuries of knowing about and hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ. But they took that step of faith never having heard anything from him, but believing that he was him. And then they went on and shared it with others. If you're going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing you've got to do is be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a believer up here, but a believer here and a believer here and all the space in between. A believer not that he existed, but that he is. A believer not that he just died on Calvary's cross, but he died for you on Calvary's cross. He bore your sins. You can forget all the other people in here. Forget all of the other people in the whole wide world. He died for you. You, personally, on Calvary's cross, and bore your personal sins and paid the penalty for what you have done on Calvary's cross. You have got to not just believe that He is the Son of God, that He is God, not just believe that He died for you, and that's what happens with a lot of people. They'll walk down an aisle of a church and a preacher will say, do you believe this, do you believe that, do you believe that, do you believe that? Yes, I believe that. But you, do you believe enough to surrender your life to Him as your Lord and your Savior? You see, it's not just that head knowledge about it. To be a follower of Jesus, I've got to first of all be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got to know there's no doubt about it. He is the Savior of the world. There is no other way on the face of this earth, in any other religion, in any other thing, that shows a person how to get to heaven. Now they may say they can, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, comes to the Father, but by me. No one gets there except through the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you say, I'm a follower, I'm a disciple, are you truly a believer in the Lord Jesus? So much so that you have surrendered everything to Him. Not only is a follower a believer, but a follower is also a learner. Now look at it. When the two disciples of John heard John say, Behold the Lamb of God, it says the two, in verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. 
Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to him, What do you see? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. They spent the day with Jesus, learning more about him. You see, if I'm going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am going to have a desire to learn everything that I can about Him. I'm going to have a desire to get to know Him better. Why? Because if I truly know Him, I'm in love with Him. And when you're in love with someone, not so much if you love someone, but if you are in love with someone, you want to know everything you can about that person. You want to know everything. So you try and learn every you try and learn how they react in different situations. You try and understand their traits, their personality their habits, everything that there is to know about that person, you want to know it because you love them. You're in love with them. And when I have the faith to believe and surrender my life to someone, I need to be in love with that person. So I should have a deep desire in my heart to know everything that I can know about Him. Now, you can go on Amazon, you can go to Christian book distributors, you can go to Lifeway, and you can find a whole bunch of books that tell you all about Jesus. But there's one that doesn't have any error, and it's this one. And it tells you everything you need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. It will tell you everything about Him. And listen, if you go and you buy books and they tell you more about Jesus than the Bible tells you, they're making it up. Because there's nothing to know more than what the Bible tells you about the Lord Jesus Christ. There wasn't the friend of Jesus or this person that got into the inner circle of Jesus and wrote a book about Him. The only book about Him is the one inspired by the Holy Spirit. Right here. And everything you need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ is right here. And you know what? If you, your life were conformed into the image of Jesus, which the Holy Spirit is trying to do if you're truly a believer, if you were really conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got enough to live up to right here than trying to add anything extra to it. I'll be a learner. If I'm a follower, I am also a learner about everything about Him. Not only do I want to know everything about the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to know about God, the Father. I want to know about God, the Holy Spirit. You see, I can't just leave it at Jesus. Because Jesus is God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. There's only one God. And if I want to know about God, I've got to know about Father, Son, and Spirit. So, it's going to take... How much study is it going to take to learn about all three 
a lifetime. It will take a lifetime of study to learn everything that you can learn. And I guarantee you, if you start as a teenager, which probably most of us didn't do, even though we may have been saved at that age, if you start as a teenager, say you start as a 9 or 10 year old, and you start trying to learn everything you can about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and you live to be 140 years old, you're still just scratching the surface. You haven't got there yet. And if God gives you another 20 years to 160, spend them studying, learning everything you can about Him. Being a follower means being a believer. Being a follower means being a learner. Being a follower means being concerned about others. Andrew went and got his brother Simon, who Jesus changed his name to Peter, the rock, the stone. Philip, Jesus found Philip, Philip went and got Nathaniel and said, Hey, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. We found the one who has come to set us free from the bondage of sin, to set us free from everything that we have done and give us a home in heaven for all eternity. Nathaniel, Let me introduce you to him. Simon, let me introduce you to the Messiah. You see, they were concerned that their friends, that their family members also knew about the Messiah. They were concerned because they understood that if He is truly the Messiah, and they believed He was. Then anyone who did not also receive Him as their Lord and their Savior would spend eternity lost. And that lostness is in hell. You see, this is the biggie here. But being a believer is a big one. Being a learner is a big one because it requires discipline and time to do it. But being concerned is the really biggie. Because a lot of people can say, I'm a believer. Some people can say, I'm a learner. But there aren't that many that would say, I am concerned enough that I am going and telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the latest statistic somewhere around there is it takes 40 to 50 Southern Baptists to lead one person to the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, it doesn't take them because a lot of them aren't trying, aren't going. But yet, they're saying, I'm a follower. I'm a disciple. You've got to be concerned. Because that mother, father, child, husband, wife, friend, whatever it may be, may be lost for all eternity. And you're the one that knows what they need to do. And you're saying, I'm a follower. I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe and I know. But 
Are you sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others? Are you letting them know that He loves them? He died for them and they needed that because they are sinners. Now let me tell you something. I'm not asking you to go out and take your Bible and start banging them over the head and saying you better get right. I'm asking you to go out and love them and tell them I love you and because I love you so much I've just got to share with you Jesus died for your sins and you have sinned. The Bible tells us we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God loves you. The Bible tells us that God loves you so much that even while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. And that God sent His only Son into this world so that if you would believe, He would forgive you and give you the gift of eternal life. I'm not sharing this with you because I'm mad at you. I'm not sharing this with you just because I think I got to do it. I'm sharing this with you because I love you. And I would love to see your sins forgiven. And the only way they can do that is through Jesus. Would you like me to explain to you how He can forgive your sins and what you need to do? Yes, I would. Then you can go and you can tell them what they need to do. But I don't know what they need to do. If you're saved, you do know. Because there's no other way to get to heaven than the way you got to heaven. Through repenting of your sins, turning away from them, and turning to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Will you do that? Will you go to that person that you love and not beat them over the head with the Bible, but say, simply because I love you so much, I have got to share this with you. And then leave it between them and God on what they do. Maybe there are some of you here today that need to know that. That God loves you. That Jesus died for you. And He paid the penalty for your sins so you don't have to do it. What do you need to do? You need to confess that you are a sinner. You need to turn away from those sins and by faith invite Jesus to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. We're going to sing a song called A Hymn of Invitation. And that is an invitation for you to get up where you're at. We're all going to stand where you're at right now to come, say, Pastor Mike, I want to invite Jesus to come into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. Will you do that this morning? If you're not a member of Brown Road, but you believe this is where God wants you to be, will you come this morning and join the church? Or maybe you need to come and pray. You come and do that. Father, as we come to you, Right now, Lord God, I just pray that in everything we will be obedient to you, that those who are here today who have not yet accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior will do that. Others will come and join, and that it will all be for your glory. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So as we stand and sing, I need thee every hour, you come.